So, is the 2009 PSP re-release the superior version of the game? Short answer, absolutely. Especially for Western players. But, let's be real. If you stuck around for the last two hours of this series, you're here for the long answer. And that requires thorough examination. Sadly, there are many issues that stops this from being the definitive version of the game. Atlas didn't just re-release an old PS1 game so a new generation could discover it. They made many attempts to tailor it to modern sensibilities. Much like how Revelation's Persona changed itself for a Western audience. Let's start with all the good quality of life editions. The game now runs much smoother, and has a quicker flow to its combat. There's now a skip feature when you press start that speeds up the battles even more and skips all the animations and effects. Dungeon exploration has also been massively sped up too. In the original game, your character walked through corridors. Now they go from 0 to 60 at a moment's notice. The dungeons themselves have had minor changes in places. When I played through the Seabeck route, I made sure to use our old strategy guide from part 2. It still works for the most part, but certain areas have been changed, sometimes drastically. They didn't introduce any new gimmicks or anything, they just rearranged things a little. They also added more velvet rooms, stores, and most notably, save points. You no longer have to worry about doing entire dungeons again if you die. There's usually a save point close to the boss room. Because of this, the video world now isn't quite as intimidating as it once was. You can save around two thirds in instead of just right at the start. It's like they knew they had nerfed this place a little too much though, because there's now damage flaws in the water just before Pandora. It's a minor annoyance. The extra save points were only added to the Seabeck route though. The Snow Queen quest still retains its trademark endurance dungeons. The game now tells you when your persona ranks up and learns new skills, which is a nice touch. You can also actually see your persona affinity, which was a strange omission from the original game. It takes out some of the guesswork when you're choosing which personas to fuse. You no longer have to reload your formation after an ambush. The game does it automatically. The auto battle menu now has more options. The stores now tell you who each weapon is for. In the original version, you just had to guess. And you can now see those invisible grids. There's a couple of newly added skills that address my complaints about the original game. One that allows you to instantly walk back to the entrance of dungeons, and one that reduces the encounter rate. Thank god. Both of which were taken from previous Persona games. The FMV cutscenes from the original have been completely remade, probably to fit the new sleeker design. The old FMVs were charming and kind of airy, so it's disappointing to see them gone. Their replacement isn't bad at all though. It's a more modern and natural looking CGI that does a great job at capturing the characters in 3D. A lot of the minimalism is gone, especially in Philemon's scenes, which now closer resembles his appearance in the Persona 2 duology. But overall, there's not much to complain about. They even added in scenes that just weren't possible in the original game, such as Mai's first appearance at the start of the game, the hospital transforming after visiting Maki, the reveal of Maki's mask in the Lost Forest, Maki telling the protagonist that she loves him at the end, a nice scene of the characters at school after they defeat Pandora. This wasn't in the original game at all. Oddly, there are some FMVs that remain exclusive to the PS1 version, one of them is that scene we talked about earlier, the one that teases the Snow Queen quest. The characters now just stand around and wonder where the school went. So the FMV remains in the version of the game without the Snow Queen quest, 
But it's absent from the version that does. How ironic. It's worth mentioning that these new FMVs also include voice acting, and not for just Philemon anymore. Thank you. I hope you'll still think about me at least once in a while. The Japanese version, in their infinite wisdom, decided it would be best to not have any voices at all, and just have subtitles. Probably to keep it closer to the original game. The game now has multiple difficulties. Easy, normal, and expert. So, if you want to torture yourself by making the Snow Queen route even harder, you now can. On the technical side of things, we have a higher resolution and a wider aspect ratio. Battles and cutscenes have been zoomed out slightly because of this, meaning there's now more of that empty space that leads to the abstract void. There's also been some new floors added to the game's grind dungeons. The ruins in Seabeck, and Devil's Peak in Snow Queen. This is unlocked after you beat the game, but strangely, there's still no new game plus. This was a really obvious feature to add, especially since it's been present in the series since the Persona 2 duology. Okay, so we've gone over all of the good changes. Now let's go into some of the more questionable ones. There's a new overworld map that completely replaces the 3D one from the original game. It looks very close to the first Shin Megami Tensei game. This could have been perfectly fine, but there's a couple small issues with it. Firstly, it's too small. You don't get the same kind of feeling of exploring a town. It gives the game a much more cramped and compact feeling which may have been intentional given that this version was meant to be played on a handheld. Secondly, it's incredibly easy to move down the wrong street by mistake because of how imprecise the movement is. This could have been ignored on its own, but not when you have to deal with random encounters because of it. Overall, the new user interface is far less stylish than the original games. It lacks a lot of the same character and charm, just take a look at the original battle menu. It just oozes Knight's attitude and cool. I'm quite the fan of these metal dialogue boxes that the majority of the game uses. They even let you change its background in the options menu. But what does the PSP version have instead? Dull grey menus and a boring battle interface. The game has been robbed of its style. This can also be felt in the new sound design. Take it. The original game had some awesome sound effects, but this version outright discards them or homogenizes them all. The battle menu sound effects are now just the same as the menu sound effects. There's also missing sound effects from other places as well, such as the scream when you fall down a hole. The Deva system is now completely silent as it goes out of control. The door to the Avidia world no longer has that oppressive heartbeat. While we're talking about this scene, let's compare the music as well. Doesn't quite sound like we're about to enter the final dungeon now, does it? This brings us to the most controversial aspect of the PSP version, the new music. People seem to be split down the middle on this. There's a camp that absolutely loves the new tracks, and then there's a camp that feels they're a massive betrayal of the original game's tone. I fall into the latter camp. Earlier, I mentioned that the soundtracks of Persona 3 and 4 would have a huge influence on the soundtrack in this game, but what did I mean by that exactly? Persona 1 utilised a lot of dark ambience that made you feel like you were entering a modern day fantasy setting. It 
It was slow and methodical music that set a very deliberate tone. It's the kind of stuff that puts you in the right mindset for these type of games. Alone at midnight, with nothing but a glowing CRT television in front of you. This is something that Persona 1 inherited from the mainline Shin Megami Tensei games, and it's something that would continue in the Persona 2 duology. Starting with Persona 3, this would change. This was, as I've already mentioned, a new era of Atlas. Shoji Meguro originally worked on the soundtrack of Persona 1, along with Kenichi Tsuchiya and others. For Persona 3, he would become the main composer and really establish his own style. The new flavour was electronic hip-hop with a heavy emphasis on lyrics. Persona 4 would build on this and add more J-pop to the mix. The new favourite instrument was the electric guitar, and this would find its way into many of the key tracks in the OST. This is the style that Atlas would attach to their re-release of Persona 1, possibly so it would appeal to the new fans that discovered the series with 3 and 4. Now, Shoji Meguro's work on these games is excellent, and I'm not going to say otherwise. His new style fit these games because it was there from the very beginning. It was woven into the fabric of the games themselves. Sadly, this is not the case with the new soundtrack for Persona 1. The main battle theme of the PS1 game was heavy and industrial sounding. It sounded like a fight to the death. What replaced it is a song called A Lone Prayer, sung by Yumi Kawamura, who also sang many songs in Persona 3's soundtrack. It just doesn't fit. It sounds like two drastically different tones clashing with each other. The game's boss themes were given a similar treatment. Not all of the soundtrack was replaced, and not all of it was replaced with tracks that sound out of place. It's an issue that affects just the key tracks. At the end of the day, we could probably agree to disagree on this. It's an issue of taste, and obviously, not everyone is going to have the same opinion on this as I do. However, there are other mistakes in the soundtrack that can't be resolved this way. Allow me to explain. The original game had a soundtrack with over 100 tracks, but not all of them have PSP equivalents. In the original, each character had their own theme song that was meant to convey their personality. The PSP version discards all of these, and replaces them with generic tracks that have nothing to do with the characters. Mark's theme returns, but it isn't even used as his theme anymore. It doesn't play where it originally did, but it plays during some of Ayase and Reiji's scenes. Mai's theme gets a similar treatment. It's in the game, it just doesn't play during any of her scenes anymore. It's replaced by Aki's mischievous theme, which doesn't fit Mai's personality. So where is Mai's theme in the PSP version? I'll tell you. Places where it shouldn't be. It plays when you meet Chisato as the Harem Queen, and when you confront Aki and Kandori. Yes, Mai and Aki's themes have been switched in some instances. Atlas? How does that even happen? But at least Aki's theme plays in the right places for the most part. As does Maki's. It's kind of jarring hearing Maki's theme used correctly in the PSP version, 
because no one else gets this treatment. Let's move on from theme songs, because there's plenty more to take issue with here. The beginning and end of tracks are completely gone. The boss fights used to have this ominous sounding introduction part, which would be replaced with the actual battle theme when you hit fight. After you won the battle, the song would play itself out. In the PSP version, we just have the battle theme on loop the entire battle. Even the Tezo boss fight does this. And this is one of the few places that uses the original music. It's like they were trying to strip the game of its variety. There's no longer any alternate battle track when characters first summon their personas. And the video world no longer has a second phase to its music. It's mostly a complete butchering of the original sound design and music. However, it's not all bad. This version does do some things that I would have liked to have seen in the original game. There's a lot of new music that doesn't clash with the old music. It feels like stuff you would have found in the original release. A good example is the new Video World music. The original A Video World track isn't completely gone from the game either. It's still present in the Snow Queen quest. Sadly, it's much shorter and loops before it kicks in, but it's still there. Also, they've rearranged some things in the Snow Queen quest. The Deva Yuga music has been removed from the top of the Ice Castle, and the Snow Queen boss theme is now the actual final boss theme, which it should have been in the first place. All of these are welcome improvements, but it's a shame the bad far outweighs the good in this case. The soundtrack is now a lot more inconsistent. It feels like it can't decide what it wants to be, it wants to retain the feel of the original game, but it also wants to be like Persona 3 and 4. It feels like those two eras of Atlas are battling it out in musical form. If this game is ever re-released, there needs to be some middle ground struck here. It needs to remain true to its roots. The extra save points are fine, but I would have liked to have seen all the same music and sound effects playing in the right places. A lot of you in the comments section have been perplexed why I would ever play the PlayStation 1 version. For me, it comes down to tone and how the game makes me feel. The PS1 version has an eerie, overworldly feel to it. That really drags me into the era it was made. I'm able to look past a lot of the flaws because of this. Even the ones in the original localization. The PSP version, in comparison, feels more sterile. It doesn't quite have the same grasp on itself. You can feel the clash between these two different eras of game design. There's a lot of stuff I've had to leave out, just for the sake of time. Just a lot of small nitpicks that I really wanted to mention. But if I did, we'd be here for many more hours. And we still have one more challenge left to tackle. In Persona 1, each character represents a scene of the major arcana. Within these arcanas are personas with similar characteristics. We've already examined how this affects the gameplay, but what does it tell us about the characters and their roles in the story? The protagonist represents the Emperor Arcana. He's the leader of our group of friends, who everyone can rely on and defer to when it's time to make an important decision. His ultimate persona is Amun Ra. Amun Ra is an Egyptian god whose name means hidden light. His final skill, Hieroglyphian, symbolizes the end of a journey, the potential to overcome any odds. This is why it's so effective against bosses. 
Next we have Maki Sonomura, who is the main heroine of the Seabeck storyline. She represents the High Priestess, an arcana that is linked to the unconscious mind and inner wisdom. Those who fall under this arcana can't resolve their issues by exploring the external world. The answers they seek lie in the deepest recesses of their unconscious mind, which ties in incredibly well with her own journey, as we explored in part one. Her ultimate persona is Verdandi, one of the norms from Norse mythology who weaves the fate of gods and men. Yukino Mayuzumi represents the Empress, an arcana that describes a nurturing and maternal woman. This fits Yukino quite well as the team's big sister figure. Her persona, Durga, has a similar archetype. Mark represents the Chariot, an arcana that points towards heroism, confidence, and victory. It can also be read as representing freedom which fits in nicely with Mark's rebellious nature. There are repeated mentions of him being a graffiti artist, and it's implied he's had many run-ins with the cops. His ultimate persona is Susanoo, the Japanese storm god that slain the Yamata no Orochi. He's known as one of the more mischievous Shinto gods, making him a good fit for Mark's silly yet good-natured personality. Keinanjo represents the Hierophant, an arcana that is a symbol of authority, law, and traditionalism. This is manifested in Kei's pragmatic decision-making throughout the story. He tends to act how he thinks his mentors would act, rather than on his own gut feelings. This places him in stark contrast to Mark at many points, who is prone to acting more in emotion than logic, his ultimate persona is an interesting one to say the least. It isn't an important figure from mythology like the rest of the characters. It's actually his butler, Yamaoka, who dies at the very start of the game. Yamaoka was Kei's guardian that wanted nothing more than to be by his side as he realized his potential. His final appearance as a persona was through sheer determination. After all, what is a persona if not a guardian figure that helps the characters on their journey? Eriko Kirishima represents the Judgment Arcana. Ellie is shown to be the down-to-earth rich girl. Unlike Kei, she gets on well with everyone around her, despite her interest in the occult and some of her other eccentric behaviours. Judgment points towards success and understanding after great difficulties. Ellie's time spent studying overseas gives her a worldliness that the rest of the cast lacks. Her ultimate persona is the Archangel Michael. Brown represents the Justice Arcana. Its imagery symbolizes empathy and balance. This could be referring to Brown's ability to be the objective voice in certain situations, putting him somewhere between Mark and Kay. His ultimate persona is Tyre, the Norse war god who presides over law and justice. Yuka Ayase represents the Magician Arcana. This arcana is associated with confidence, creativity, and action. Ayase isn't the smartest character in the cast. In fact, the English dub makes her sound like a valley girl. But she is incredibly blunt and defined more by her actions than her shallow personality. Her ultimate persona is the Norse god Freya. And the final character is Reiji Kido, who actually represents two arcanas, Devil and Death. His initial arcana, the Devil, points towards the Jungian shadow, the rejected and taboo parts of ourselves. Reiji Kido is the half-brother of Takehisa Kandori. The latter's father had taken his mother as a mistress, and had thrown her away once he was done with her. This is something that greatly angered Reiji. But because Kandori's father is no longer alive, he projects this onto Kandori himself. 
The Devil Arcana symbolizes Reiji's single-minded quest for vengeance. It could also be read in a darkly comic way, with Reiji himself being the repressed part of the Kandori family. Towards the end of the game, he transitions to the Death Arcana, with the ultimate persona, Mott. The Death Arcana points towards an ending and a new beginning. Since you won't get Reiji's ultimate persona until after defeating Kandori, we can take this as a sign that Reiji can now move on from the evil done to his mother, and start a new life. That covers every playable party member. It's impossible to play as all of these characters in one run-through of the game. There are two campaigns, as I've already mentioned. The Seabeck route and the Snow Queen route, and each one has its own set of exclusive and optional party members. Seabeck has Maki, Kay and Mark as its mandatory cast. The fifth party member can be either Brown, Ayase, Ellie or Reiji. Most first time players tend to go with Brown because he's the first character that offers to join your party, and you're not exactly going to turn down the extra manpower. If you do turn him down though, you'll have the opportunity to recruit Ellie in the subway later on, or Ayase if you decide to go straight to Seabeck. At this point, if you don't have a fifth member, Ayase will force her way into the party. However, there are a series of steps you can follow that will eventually lead to Reiji. Before heading to the hospital at the start of the game, go to the teacher's lounge. You'll hear about a student hanging around in an empty classroom on the second floor. Go here and you'll meet Reiji for the first time. After this, talk to the student in class 2-1, and then Reiji's mother at the convenience store on Joy Street. She'll ask if you know her son, and requests that you try and make friends with him. After this is done, never speak to his mother again. Doing so a second time will stop you from recruiting Reiji for some reason. Poor woman, she just keeps getting abandoned. Head to the casino and talk to this guy, and you'll learn that Reiji likes hanging around at the abandoned factory. If you visit that location, he'll give you the cold shoulder and leave. After escaping from the hospital, head straight to the Seabeck building. You'll meet Reiji yet again. Assuming you've turned down everyone wanting to join the party, Reiji will join sometime after you arrive in Maki's ideal world. And that is every possible party combination available in the Seabeck route. The Snow Queen route has Yukino and Ayase as its mandatory members, with Kay, Brown and Ellie being optional. At the start of the quest, you'll have to choose at least two of them. The Snow Queen quest is an interesting alternate storyline in the game. It isn't tied directly to the Seabeck route other than a couple nods here and there. They're both independent anomalies that just happen to be taking place at the same time. This quest is started when the protagonist begins looking into the Snow Queen play. This was an old tradition at the school, where an actress would be selected to play the Snow Queen and wear a strange mask that is rumoured to be cursed. The last performance of this play was eight years before the start of the game, and it involved Miss Seiko, the protagonist's homeroom teacher. Since then, the mask has been sealed away and stored behind the gym. After hearing about all of this, the protagonist decides to retrieve the mask. For some reason. It comes back into contact with Miss Seiko, who, doubting its curse, decides to wear the mask. This is when her body is taken over by the mask's curse, and turns the school into an ice castle, surrounded by four towers. It tells the party that it plans to use Seiko as a sacrifice to bring about the Eternal Night, an apocalyptic event that will freeze everything and cause nothing but despair. In order to prevent this and save Seiko, the cast will have to find all the shards of the Demon Mirror that have been scattered across the three towers. Hypnos Tower, Nemesis Tower and Thanatos Tower. Each of the three are guarded by an actress who had previously played the Snow Queen. This storyline is partially based on the fairy tale The Snow Queen 
by Hans Christian Andersen, as I'm sure you've gathered by now. However, this is a little bit of a red herring, as we will see you later in the story. For now, I want to focus on how this storyline uses the fairy tale as a basis. Firstly, we have the obvious elements, the mirror and its scattered shards. In the original story, the magic mirror is unable to accurately reflect the good in people. It's only able to amplify their ugliness. When the mirror is broken, its splinters are scattered all over the world, and find their way into people's eyes and hearts. This freezes their hearts, and only allows them to see the world as the mirror does, through an ugly lens. This is paralleled in the game with the residents of the towers, each of whom hold fragments of the mirror, seeing the world through a similar lens of negativity. This is something that is manipulated by the Snow Queen so she can turn them into servants in the afterlife. Essentially, they all have their wishes granted by allowing themselves to be killed. This brings us to their appearance as spirits in the towers. Hypnos Tower has Kumi Hirose, a girl who imprisons people in her dream world because she believes it to be preferable to reality. Should you decide to explore Kumi's dream world, you see a flashback that explains why this is. She was lambasted by everyone at school and at home because of her grades. She wishes for an escape. She wishes for a gentle reality that was free from hostility. A world of dreams that was under her control. She was granted the Guardian Hypnos by the Snow Queen, the personification of sleep. Next, we have the Guardian of Nemesis Tower, Michiko Matsudera, an arrogant girl who feeds off of negative emotions. When she's defeated, she reveals that she bribed her way into the Snow Queen role, and that she was mocked relentlessly by the other students. Unlike Kumi, she doesn't admit that she was in the wrong when she's defeated. Instead, she swears vengeance against the party. She was granted the Guardian Nemesis, the personification of retribution. The final Guardian is of Thanatos Tower, Yuriko Yamamoto. Unlike the others, she had no trouble in her life. Everything was going great. Until, one day, she became frightened that it might, eventually, all fade away. She became obsessed with stopping time and remaining young, beautiful, and happy forever. This is what the Snow Queen mask tempted her with. At some point, during her solitary stay in the tower, she realized the errors in her thinking. She wished for someone to come and put her out of her misery. Her guardian is Thanatos, the personification of death. After collecting all of the mirror shards, Seiko is freed and we find out who is controlling the Snow Queen mask. It turns out to be Seiko's best friend from the old drama club, Tomomi. Tomomi was cast in the Snow Queen role over Seiko back when the two were competing for the role. However, this was only because Seiko withdrew when she heard about the rumours surrounding the mask. Tomomi was consumed by the mask and blamed Seiko for letting it happen. Tomomi is not the mastermind behind the ordeal though. She's just another one of the mask's victims. Hypnos, Nemesis and Thanatos. All of these personifications point towards the true identity of the Snow Queen their mother in mythology, the personification of the night, the goddess Nyx. The mirror that shows only negative distortion convinced Tomomi what she had become, but this also gave independence to her persona, the Night Queen Nyx. She's a being that was given birth by humanity's collective desire to turn hope into despair. Every actress that played the Snow Queen brought with them their own feelings of despair and weakness, turning the mask into a powerful hotbed of negative emotions. At some point, we can assume this attracted Nyx, a dark figure that attempts to grant their wish for death. Just as she granted Kumi, Michiko and Yuriko's wishes, so too will she try and grant everyone's with the Eternal Night. 
But just as Pandora was defeated by Hope in the Seabeck route, so is Nyx. Wait a minute. You have to unseal the mask from the box, which releases the evil Snow Queen curse. And the only thing that can defeat her is Hope? It's Pandora's box again, isn't it? While we're bringing in elements from the Seabeck route, it's worth mentioning the two figures that appear alongside the Night Queen. When the Queen decides to fight the party at full strength, they can be seen making up the left and right side of her body, as if they're supporting her head. These two appear to be Maki and Kandori wearing masks, but they're obviously not the same characters. Kandori appears to be much younger, and is wearing a St. Hermelin High uniform, while Maki was established to be outside of the school during these events. So we're left with a pretty big question. Why was Kandori and Maki, two characters that have seemingly zero relation to this plot, chosen to represent the Night Queen's physical form? Well, there is an answer. Because they're both figures that represent nihilism and destruction, their stories have a parallel that Kandori himself remarks on with his dying breath. Kandori wanted to bring about a new world through the Deva system and rule it as a god, and he succeeds in the Seabeck route. However, he finds himself utterly unfulfilled by this, and questions why he even lives at all. He still finds himself faced with despair and a desire for death, Maki, as we've already discussed, was consumed by her nihilism, and created the destructive force Pandora to end everything. This was eventually prevented, of course, but at this point in the story, Maki was still in despair. The fact that these two make up most of the Night Queen's body suggests she is nothing without mankind's despair, and it's only by overcoming this aspect of ourselves that she can be defeated. It's a bit of symbolism for those who had already played through the Seabeck route, which is who the Snow Queen route was always intended for. Its relation to the Seabeck route is more thematical than anything else. The conclusion of the Snow Queen route leads directly into the Seabeck route. The characters leave the school and continue their quest to stop Kandori. Sadly, we can only imagine what this adventure would look like, as there's no way to continue the game from here. It would have been interesting seeing Yukino fighting alongside Maki to stop Pandora, but alas, we'll have to make do with what we have. Now that we've done a pretty thorough job of looking at the story, I wanted to talk about the gameplay. This won't be 40 minutes like it was last time, it's just worth mentioning how intricate this quest can be. This part of the game is notorious for its difficulty. There are no save points within any of the towers, making completing them swiftly a priority. Hypno's Tower is the easiest, and doesn't have too many surprises beyond its time limit. Nemesis Tower can be made incredibly easy if you know what you're doing, but is really long and difficult if you don't. At one point, Michigo gives you the choice of going through the left door to fight her earlier, or going through the right door to find a mirror shard and a tip on beating her. This turns out to be a trick. The tip on beating her is that you need to get to her without delay. The longer you take getting through the dungeon, the stronger she becomes. Perhaps the most fiendish of the towers is Thanatos. When a party member dies here, their personas are sealed within Tartarus, which is a location around halfway through the dungeon. This makes losing a single party member here a death sentence. If you think that sounds intimidating, imagine if you had to beat it as the first dungeon. That's right. The game lets you challenge the towers in whatever order you please. Completing the hardest sequence, Thanatos, Nemesis, and then Hypnos, unlocks every Ambrosia item. This is known as a Max Ambrosia run, and this is the only way of fusing everyone's ultimate personas in the Snow Queen route. 
It also gives you bragging rights. Admittedly, I've never tried this myself. Maybe if you bug me enough in the comments section, I'll do it on stream one day. There's also the mirror shards to collect. There are 12 in total, and most of them are missable. Collecting at least 8 of them gets you to that true ending, where you scale the Ice Tower to fight Nyx. The upper levels of this tower are, without a doubt, the most heinous in the entire game. It's almost impossible to navigate this maze without closely following a walkthrough guide. You can get lost in here for hours, more so than even near video world. If you collect less than 8 of the mirror shards, you won't get this far though. Instead, the cast will be unable to remove the mask from Seiko. A very special bad ending. On this path, you get a unique boss fight here instead of the mask, Miss Masquerade. The Seebeck route had something similar, as you may recall, with its own share of alternate boss fights if you make bad decisions. That makes a total of four endings in the entire game. Two true endings and two bad ones. This must be what the back of the Revelations Persona box is referring to when it says there are many endings. This version only has two though, and I don't think that can be considered many. It looks like this analysis has reached its conclusion. What a journey it's been. The PSP release is not the perfect way of playing the game. Neither is that original PlayStation 1 version. The fact of the matter is, there is no perfect way of playing this game. It would be nice if we eventually got something like that. Maybe a definitive HD re-release. But it's very unlikely. It doesn't matter though. Because, no matter how long I sit here intricately explaining the faults in every version, it doesn't change the overall picture. The brilliance of Persona 1 shines through in any version you pick up. Its artistry and creativity remains forever available to us all. If there's anything that we should take away from this saga, it's this. But, of course, we're far from done because the Persona series didn't end with this game, as I'm sure you all know. It continues to this very day and shows no signs of stopping. Maybe we'll catch up at some point. Until next time, be your true mind. I hear a boss who calls me a Luke at the floor, so A huge thank you to all of my patrons. Lara, aka I'm a maid, and Mr. Clonum. 